Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and I was lucky enough recently to go to EMF Camp, which imagine a music festival, but instead of music acts, there are talks, presentations and workshops centered around the maker lifestyle. Can I say that? Which was awesome. First time I've been, and not only was it an amazing event in itself, but I also got to hang out with Katie, Lorraine, and Element 14's Phil, uh, which was wonderful. Um, but also, I got to see Sam from Look Mum No Computer do a live set on stage, which was amazing. But it made me think that we've never done an instrument for the electronics inside. So I decided to get hold of an old, hopefully, free microcontroller keyboard or electronic musical instrument. I'd have called that a keyboard. I'm sure Casio knew what they were doing and why this is called the PT30 and uh, electronic musical instrument and not a keyboard. There's probably a fascinating law case and reason behind it, but I don't know. I'm hoping this is going to be early enough that it's not just a microcontroller inside and everything comes from there. I'm hoping there are going to be some distinct, discrete chips and there's going to be something interesting in here. I'm also interested to know how the keyboard works. Is this matrixed, which means there are going to be keys which are exclusive and you can't play together? Or is it going to have enough I.O. that all of these can be played at once, in theory? What is going to be generating the, the sound waves? Is it going to be a synthesizer type chip? Or is it going to be something with pre-recorded samples? I don't know. And I'm somebody that has no rhythm and is totally tone deaf. So let's get inside and find out. The I.O. on the back of this, I mean, first of all, one, two, three, four, five, five AA batteries. Why five? It's a ridiculous number. So what's that? Six, seven and a half volts, of course. Although the barrel jack input is also seven and a half volts. So at least they're consistently weird. On the back, you also have an output. I assume that's a line level output on a six mil jack or a quarter inch jack. I think it is in American. Um, and we also have this little bay, which is awesome. And I hadn't expected that. But they call this a cassette interface, which makes me think this could record something you've set up and sequenced to a cassette. And I don't mean play audio, I mean data storage. Like early computers or 80s computers use cassettes for storage, I think this could record essentially MIDI sequencing to a cassette. Now that might be fun to play with. So let's start by popping out this module. Oh, oh, oh. So this has just got like a, a zebra stripe pressing on contacts on the PCB. That's an unusual choice for like user upgradable parts because if you get your finger grease on that, that can really mess it up. Be very careful not to break the nearly 40 year old plastic. My goodness, there's more in there than I thought there would be. Oh, so it doesn't surprise me we've got a pair of capacitors on here. I'm guessing they're going to be working as filter caps just to clean up the signal coming in and out from the cassette. So it's uh, got a ribbon that comes back and forth, but only three cores, so common ground, here and mic, so it's input and output, essentially, and a capacitor per channel. So yeah, that looks like a crystal. Makes me think there is something on here doing timing. That little uh, conductive part is just stayed in there, which is fine. I'm more than happy for it to stay there. We've actually got an IC in here. That's a Hitachi HD 3590 with some really bad soldering. There are lots of bridged contacts on there. Is that a quality issue? That looks like solder bridging. That's poor. Kind of half surprised this ever worked. And we can look up the pinouts on this and actually see if they're common and it was like grounds or voltages where that wouldn't have been an issue. But that surprises me, really surprises me. So we have an array of screws all over the place. And on the back, you've also got the tuning. So you can actually retune this if it start, if How would you do that? Because I'm guessing the sound, the sound is probably time based. So I'm guessing that's going to be affecting a timing like an oscillator circuit or something. I don't know. Why am I guessing when we could just open it up and see? OK, screws are out. Let's have a look. Oh, oh, 
yeah, the sound of disintegrating foam. Unmistakable, and if I touch that, it's just gonna, yeah, falls to pieces. Now I think that's just sort of sound deadening foam around the cables to the battery bank, just to make sure they didn't rattle around inside. And lovely looking board, big traces, like really big traces. I'm guessing power and ground bus that run all the way around the outside, get smaller by the other end. Let's whip this all out. Oh yeah, that's the kind of age board I was hoping to see here. Interesting, there's still lots of daughter boards. It's not even just like two main single-sided boards. There's daughter boards here and here as well. Oh, that's the interface card that made contact with this ribbon, the zebra strip just there. That looks like this display ribbon. That's the analog interface board. In fact, that's probably got the three potentiometers on it. Yeah. So you've got the switch here, but these actual potentiometers, which are main volume, cord, and rhythm, are on a separate daughter board because they come this side. She's leading me to sort of think that maybe this is like an analog audio amplification type board. And this is more the digital side. Yeah, there you go. 25K, 50K, and a 50K. A lovely smooth action on them. It's like they haven't been used much. Never had much luck with sort of linear slider. Um, I guess these are graphite film type. Still another screw there. That was close. Now I'm going to be very careful as I lift this board out because I suspect that's the display ribbon. And I don't know how that display is held in. Is it just pressure from this board? Is there something here I'm missing completely? Oh yeah, a total screw here. Ooh, I can hear all the buttons falling out. I'm going to be very careful to keep those in place. Having had all those wonderful screws all over the place, this little interface board appears to be double-sided tape. Hopefully that screen is just going to lift out without falling to pieces. So far, so good. There you go. So. This is the back of all the buttons and yeah, they are largely sort of membranes. So that one was up here. You see all those carbon uh, or graphite pads on the back of the rubber that just make and break on various traces on the PCBs. But they've used that everywhere, basically. Even the sliding power button is based on graphite pads on a little, like an acetate type transfer paper. and. That would wear out really quickly. I wouldn't be surprised if I if that was the thing that failed first on almost all of these. So if you have one of these that's got a bad power switch, you can get pens that will refill in that graphite coating. You can even try going over it with a very soft, soft pencil. I don't think it'd work quite so well on plastic, but there are ways of bringing this back to life if your switch has failed. I'm gonna lift this very carefully with all the buttons still in place out the way. So here is the screen, which has got a nice little Epson sticker on it. Here we have all the traces for the passives and two ICs. Now I suspect they are analog components. I reckon those are probably amplifiers, he very boldly says. Oh, there is a really chintzy little foldy metal bit, which I bet lined up with that hole here, which had the letter P next to it. So it's not even like that's reset, it's P. Maybe that's program? Maybe you could update the ROMs on board from the external connector down here if you held down that button. That would be interesting. And then on this main board, which handles all of the IO, you can see all of the uh, pads from all the buttons, each of the individual keys, even the black keys are still on here, the whites are still in the tray. But yeah, this chip here, this NEC IC, appears to be handling all the I.O., including driving the display. Let's look up some part numbers. So I've had a little bit of a dig about, and this is very, I don't wanna say simple, because that would be really unfair, but a lot of the work is being done by a single IC, which is kinda cool, but not what I was hoping for either. So on this board, which I'm still gonna sort of call the analog board, it's probably unfair. So this chip up here is basically the audio amp. This is wired straight up to the speaker as an output and handles the amplification. This is a quadruple multiplexer, which can be used for modulation, demodulation, and I suggest that's probably being used to 
blend some of the digital channels together before it goes through the amplifier so you get a true sort of analog output. Now going back over here being very careful of all this. So this little chip over here, this Hitachi 61914, it's actually RAM, which kind of blows my mind that they needed separate RAM. It's weird to think system on a chip and you get gigabytes of RAM on the die with everything else. But no, that is separate RAM, which runs with this, this NEC chip, which is a dedicated synthesizer CPU. So this actually handles all the IO, all the synthesis and enough IO to run the display as well. It's a great little chip. I'm sure a lot of keyboards probably have this at the heart of it, and it's got a lot of good functionality. What I will say about this board, with all the single-sided PCBs, they have done wonders to fit this all on. And something I can't say I remember seeing in any other product is this weird way they bridge traces. So you've got the traces actually etched into the copper, and then you've got pads, but between the pads, they then put this coating down, this blue stuff, which is like an extra insulator. It's like a, an additional silk screen or, or an additional solder mask. And then they've put additional traces over the top of it again, but they're like printed on. They're, they're additional, I don't know if they're copper traces or whether they're some other material, conductive material, like maybe graphite again. But then there's got another solder mask over the top which is a very clever way of getting around the limitations of these being single-sided boards. But like I say, I don't think I've seen this anywhere else in all the teardowns we've done. So that's, that's novel. And again, it's interesting to see where they've used individual boards. I'm surprised they didn't try and rationalize these down through case design, making those little uh, plastic buttons a little bit longer so they could go onto a board the same depth as this rather than having to have them separate. Feels like it would have been a cost saving, saving the ribbon and the soldering, but I don't know, maybe the injection molding was more complicated and maybe the plastic was just a little bit more expensive back then. I don't know. Maybe you know. If you've got answers to any of these questions, please let me know over at the Element 14 community. It's always great when people with more knowledge than me can fill in the gaps for people that also don't have the knowledge. Come join the conversation. This separation between the digital and the analog, I, I guess this is all down to what side they wanted the PCB on being a single-sided board, because the traces are here, and I guess that's a limitation of the components being used, but it's, it just seems strange that you would cut that hole out of one PCB just so you could fit another PCB in the gap. Double-sided PCB, I mean, they were technically possible back then, so why not use them? Was the cost that prohibitive? A lot of holes in a capacitor space over here, Oh, interesting, because they've actually got the name, the, the HD61914 on the back here. I wonder if we can work out what this missing IC is. They've bridged between two pins because it isn't used in this model. But I wonder if we can find out what the upgrade options and paths were from here. Maybe that's something to do with the unused and damaged trace or, or cut trace in, in the expansion module. Could be interesting. Two channel NAND gate. Why would you have that as an optional extra? What am I missing? Hmm, interesting. If you know or you've seen something with this IC in it, let me know over at the Element 14 community. Love to know what additional functionality that provided that we're missing in this model. Well, that is the inside of everybody's top present on their Christmas list from 1983. And I have to be honest, I like this age and this style of PCB design. Seeing those bridging traces, I've never seen before. Single-sided PCBs must have been a huge limitation when you were trying to design one. Um, but all the passives on one board and the digital I.O. on the other. And these sort of daughter boards cut into spaces. How happy was everybody when we got double-sided PCBs almost as standard? I hope you've enjoyed this one. If you've got an idea for a teardown you'd like to see, head over to the Element 14 community and let me know. Links are in the description. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.